Chapter 19, Duck Pond. The end of the school year was uneventful. The kids who had beaten up Corey returned but left him alone. Don hung out with Corey as much as he could before he left to live with his father for the month of June. Since school was out, Corey had more time to explore the barrens. On warmer days, he would check out his favorite duck pond. The wildlife managers dug a few of these throughout the barrens to provide nesting sites for ducks and a water source for animals. This one provided more benefit, a place to swim. Located a mile and a half from the nearest road, the pond co covered almost three acres. This was much larger than other ponds he knew about. It was also deeper. Corey didn't often swim in the pond because doing so chased the animals away. And Corey liked to see the animals most of all. No matter how slowly and calmly he tried to approach the pond, they knew he was there. The chorus frogs would stop singing and the three, the tree swallows would find another place to hunt insects. Corey knew that if he kept absolutely still for 20 minutes, the show would start again. The tree swallows would again skim the surface of the water for a drink and the chorus frogs would start their high pitched calls. Sometimes a bullfrog would add a bass line to the tune. Every now and then a deer would come down for a quick drink. In the middle of the pond, he could not touch the bottom. Even on his deepest dives into the dark brown water, he liked not touching the bottom. The bottom was mucky, the bottom was slippery, the bottom was gross. It bothered Corey that, he, that touching the bottom bothered him. He felt that he was acting like the kids at school and they were stupid. He knew, that, he knew what, what the muck was it was nothing more than leaves and of grasses and water plants that were breaking down, decomposing at the bottom of the pond. He knew it was an important part to a health of a pond community. Nutrients locked in the leaves of the plants were being made available to other parts of the ecosystem. It was like the story Odyssey that his mom read to him from Sand County Almanac. He would never tell anyone he didn't like the feel of the dark, wet muck at the bottom of his feet. He really didn't like to tell anyone anything much about himself at all. They wouldn't understand. It had been hot for a week. Today, it would hit 95 degrees in the middle of the afternoon. Corey knew that the heat came from the high pressure system parked over the state. Dry, hot air was pouring in from the desert southwest. The sky was cloudless and it had not rained for days. People in the town were spending every minute putting water on lawns and gardens. People are stupid, Corey muttered. They take plants that are not adapted to this climate and plant the, them in sandy soil that can't hold any water. Then they rewarded them with well-watered weeds and a lawn that needs to be cut every week. How dumb. Corey scanned the open land surrounding him. It wasn't really prairie. It was more scrubland. Many years ago, wildfires would have passed through here just often enough to keep most of the trees out. Only oaks survived. Filling the spaces between the oaks grew deep-rooted prairie plants. These plants didn't need watering. They would do. They were doing just fine. Their deep roots let them take advantage of whatever rainwater happened to fall. After checking the sandy edge of the pond for new animal tracks, Corey decided it was hot enough for a swim. The first time he swam here, he was very self-conscious, leaving his clothes far enough from the pond to stay dry. He ran into the cool water. As far as swim swimming au natural, Corey rationalized that if someone wanted to see his naked butt so badly as to sneak a mile and a half through grass and hot uh, and uh, on hot humid day there was nothing he could do about it it took him only a few minutes to relax even enough to enjoy the swim the water at the surface was warm as bath water just eight, eight inches below the surface face groundwater was keeping the temperature near 70 degrees the trick was to kick only enough to mix the water to a comfortable temperature Corey realized that Corey relaxed and tried to forget about everything. He also forgot about the crop dusters. 
to get the correct angle of attack for spraying insecticides on potato fields adjacent the, to this part of the barren, the, a pilot would have to pass over the pond at about 150 feet. The roar of Piper's Pawnee's engine came on quickly, and the sound was made even louder by the sudden rush of our adrenaline. Corey felt as Corey felt as he dove deep into the pond to hide. He hit the muck. Corey hated the muck. The next pass took the small yellow flame a little to the east of the pond, which was subsequent pass. The plane moved even farther away. Corey wondered if he had been caught. Did the pilot see me in the pond? Corey wondered. If so, what exactly did he see? Corey got dressed and started the long walk back to his bike. As he hit the main road, he heard a plane engine again. The plane was much higher this time, probably heading home to refuel and reload the spray tanks. Corey kept telling himself that he had not been seen. What were the chances that the pilot was looking at that very spot at that very instant? Corey smiled and relaxed. It was summer, and he was not in school. It, it was at that moment that he noticed the plane again. It had changed course to fly directly over him, dripping the wings as he passed. Corey stopped smiling and was no longer relaxed. It rained heavily through the night and Corey did not sleep well. His thoughts drifted from his parents to Ellen and Ben to that stupid crop duster and to the Barrens. He didn't understand why, but he liked being in the Barrens. No, it was more than just liking the place. He somehow needed to be there. Maybe it was like Ayers Rock or Graceland. The sun was coming up and Corey could hear Ellen in the kitchen. The radio was on too loud as usual and tuned to the public radio station. Your breakfast is getting cold, Ellen called up the stairs. Be down in a minute. Minute. Corey never liked getting up early, but these days, being awake was easier than trying to sleep. Awake, he could always find other things to think about. Sleeping, or at least trying to sleep, gave him too much time to think about his parents. Morning, Corey, Ellen said calmly. Corey liked the way she didn't ask too many questions. In fact, she and Ben seemed to be the only ones who didn't. Everyone else wanted to know what he was feeling, wanted to get inside his head, wanted to pry. As Corey sat down to a plate of pancakes, the woman on the radio was running down the list of topics for the morning. Coming up at 8, Eric and his guest will discuss possible changes, changes in the income tax code. Corey rolled his eyes. At 11, Alex, Alice is in with Dr. Bill Whitehorse from the University of Wisconsin Extension Office to talk about the role of wildflower, wildflowers in a grassland ecosystem. Corey snapped his head so fast it surprised even Ellen, who was paging through a catalog of courses offered by a community college. Finally, something on public radio that real people could listen to. It was a little after six. If he did his chores quickly, he would still be able to spend some time in the Barrens and make it back by 11 to hear the radio show. Corey straightened up his room, fed Ponch, filled the bird bath, and mowed the patch of lawn he'd missed the day before. A quick pass through the garden and Corey came up with a bowl of small potatoes for supper. The other day he hadn't understood why anyone would dig them up when they were so small. Then he tasted them. About the size of the golf ball, they seemed to melt in his mouth. Of course, it helped to cover them in real butter. His mother had always used some fat-free, tasteless, but butter-like spread that turned to water when it melted. Looking down at the unwashed potatoes reminded Corey of yesterday of crop dusters and how of how his swim was cut short by a fool in a plane. The path to the duck pond took Corey past some familiar The area that had been burned in May was already green. The spider warts were in full bloom. The lupin had lost their flowers weeks ago and now had seed pods and looked like peas. His father had explained that lupin and peas were both legumes, which meant that they could take nitrogen out of the air and change it into a form that plants could use. The short clumps of plain grass, pale green grass, were big blue stem. Corey remembered how big blue stem had towered over his head in the September field with his father. If I'm still here in September, Corey stopped and thought as quickly as it started. Standing on the edge of the duck pond, Corey thought about the crop duster, laughed. Leaving a pile of clothes on the shore, he slowly walked across the mucky buck pond bottom 
until it was deep enough for swimming. Corey hated muck. His swimming skills definitely came from his mother. His father could swim more or less, but he looked like he was attacking the water with more than swimming, more, more than swimming through it. His mother was graceful, almost otter-like, in the water. She had taught Corey to swim while at a biological field station on Pigeon Lake, where his father was an instructor for a summer course. In the heart of the Chiquamagan National Forest, this was a perfect place for a family to spend time together. Corey was a strong swimmer, but mostly he just liked to float, making a few waves as possible, which gave him, gave him a different view of the pond. The water striders, striders skimmed by just inches from his chin like spiders, using the surface tension of water to keep them afloat. Half-inch beetles, called water boatmen, rode just below the surface, passing their time feasting on al algae. The frogs silenced by Corey's swimming started calling again, and the yellow swallowtail butterfly flew near the pond's edge. A squadron of dragonflies patrolled for mis patr patrolled for misquotes a few feet above the water above the pond. A feeling of being connected overwhelmed Corey. He wasn't someone viewing the pond. He was part of the pond. He knew it. The pond knew it. The pilot from yesterday was clueless. In the stillness of the morning, Corey saw a dark form slide into the water. With heightened senses, that small amount of adrenaline brought. He studied the ripples it was making. Logic took over. Logic was good. Logic made sense. Logic was the opposite of emotions, and he'd had enough emotions to last a lifetime. His first thought was that the shadow had been of a mammal. No, too small for an otter, too little wake for a muskrat. When the animal surfaced for the t a second time, it was close enough for Corey to make out the head of a turtle. But he could not lock in on the exact species, probably an eastern painted turtle. Maybe, if he was lucky, it was a Blanding's turtle, and he could take credit for finding an endangered species. The, o the only way to know for sure was to wait it out and hope it would get close enough to make a positive identification. The turtle dove again. It made a slow descent, so it may not have seen me, Corey deducted. The pond surface turned to glass. Corey treaded water just enough to stay afloat. As time passed, he started to put some pieces together. It was early July, a tiny female turtles set out looking for sandy places to bury their eggs, usually on a well-drained, south-facing slope. Something about this didn't fit. Painted turtles liked to bask on a log or a rock. There were no good basking sites here. Painted turtles are small usually less than 10 inches in diameter. This was larger, much larger. Logic, what are the chances of, of its being a Blandings, Corey thought. That would be a good thing, and good things don't happen to me, at least not anymore. The large snapping turtle surfaced just three feet from Corey's head. Logic was gone and fear took over. Both animals were using the same primitive part of their brain. Cerebrum was of no advantage at this point. One animal screamed, the other would have if it could. Swimming faster than he had thought possible, Corey quickly reached the shallow water. His feet hit the muck and he started running. He didn't worry about not liking muck. Looking back at the water, he could see only the bubbles and the muddy cloud that, his, that this encounter had created. Out of breath and shaking slightly, Corey got dressed. This was the second time in two days that his swimming had been interrupted, but today was different. The pilot was clueless as to what an ecosystem was all about. The snapping turtle was part of it. Corey was mad at the pilot. He respected the turtle. Much calmer now, Corey smiled and started the long walk home. He had to admit that it had been exciting, not that he would want to do it again. Back in town, his classmates were probably getting their kicks sitting in front of a computer screen. 
his classmates were stupid. It was 10.55 when Corey reached the farmhouse. He filled a glass of water and sat down at the kitchen table. Ellen, Ellen gave him a strange look when he reached over and turned up the volume on the radio. Good morning, I'm Alice Girardi, said the voice, sounding like a woman who'd never seen a real prairie or skinny dipped with a snapping turtle. Joining me today is Dr. Bill Whitehorse from the University of Wisconsin Extension Office. He is a botanist, a Native American, and an author of the book, Restoring the Grasslands of Wisconsin. He's here with us to talk about the role of wildflowers in a grassland ecosystem. Corey was hanging on every word. Before we take our first call, I'd like to ask our guests an important question. What is the historic significance of wildfire flowers in poetry? Openly disappointed, Corey turned the radio off and left the room. <laughs> 